Hi guys, thanks for tuning in. Today, we're gonna unbox the Creality CR5S. Unlike the standard box you'd see a printer come in, this thing comes in a bit of a, a cardboard crate, so it's gonna take some time for us to rip this guy open. All right, so as you can see, it's an enclosed printer, uh, unlike your traditional open Cartesian printer. Inside we have a spool of filament, in this case it's red, it says PLA. Collection of cables with a nylon sheathing, similar to what we see on the CR-10S and such. And the rest of this is all taped to the bottom here. Looks like we're gonna have to lift up the heated bed before we can get the rest of this out. So there's another spool of filament here, uh, another PLA, yellow. And a little toolbox with a bunch of uh, pieces inside. We'll go through that in just a minute. So, with most of that unpacked, let's go through the toolbox. It's labeled CR5S. Let's see what we have in here. After sales service card, warranty certificate, 3D printer user manual, your typical snips, some wrenches, an interesting looking wrench, and a collection of Allen keys and a small screwdriver. Your USB and power cable, there are two spool holders. They've given you glue stick, though we're not gonna use that. There's a little wrench, an eight gig uh, full-size SD card, as well as a USB stick, some spare nozzles and the little retention, or sorry, yeah, spare nozzles and couplers and the little blue retention clips to keep pressure on the, uh, on the coupler against the filament. Two small lengths of Bowden tube, a large Phillips screwdriver, your kind of standard sharpened scraper, tweezers, and a small X Acto knife. There's also a small container here of grease. Let's just take a quick look around the machine. On the front, we have the control knob and the screen, of course. On the side, there's just some ventilation here. It looks like each side has the provision for like a plexiglass window to be screwed in, though there were no plexiglass windows included with the machine. On the back, you have your extruders. The motors are on the inside. Um, and this is a Bowden drive setup, and it doesn't appear to have any filament runout sensors because that would have to be on this side of the extruder uh, mechanism. The spool holders will just connect in through here. Power and fuse, of course. And on the right-hand side of the printer, you have your USB port and a full-size SD card slot. They fashioned this kind of build tack, textured kind of material to their their build plate there. And there's a silicone heater that runs the full size of the build plate. A single uh, Z screw will move the bed up and down, running on two, they look like 10 millimeter rods, smooth rods. And it's a uh, Ultimaker style gantry. We'll get a better shot of that in a moment. So the hot end here is securely attached to the side with this kind of saran wrap to make sure it doesn't bounce around in shipping. If we remove that, we'll be able to get a better look. So it appears to be a similar hot end to the CR-10S Pro, which is kind of like a V6 clone um, with a beefy fan on the front for uh, part cooling, looks like. And I'm just gonna make sure very gently that everything is moving, moving smoothly, front and back and side to side. Especially if something gets kind of twisted at a square, uh, it can cause a lot of binding. Okay, so that looks fine. 
All right. So I may as well attach these spool holders. So this is, like I said, the, the typical kind of spool holder they use on a CR10 um, or even on the Enders, I believe. They switch to those metal ones. So just inserting it through the back and then the little nut goes on the inside. It does have two extruders, but it appears to be only a single nozzle. So it's a two in, one out, um, which will make it a little bit uh, more difficult to use something like a soluble support um, because they'll be mixing in the same nozzle. Though if you do a bunch of purging or something, you might be able to get away with that. And it has a rather small uh, heat block on it um, with the pinch type thermistor and obviously your standard heater cartridge. All right, not a whole lot of assembly to do on these guys. So let's flip this around. We'll load the filament in before we go much further and then we'll get to turn it on. So it's your standard uh, extruder uh, mechanism that you've seen on a lot of the CR10 series, um, not the Pro, they changed it to be more like the Bontech extruder dual gear style. But these ones, at least unlike an under three, these are aluminum, all metal. So as usual, I'm just cutting this on a 45 to make it easier to feed this in. Straighten it. There we go. And then we'll run that until it's almost all the way into the hot end. Unlike a normal one in one out uh, hot end, we wouldn't want to run this all the way to the tip because the two of them are actually joined into a Y a little bit above the tip of the nozzle. Um, and so we want to keep them just kind of right at the top of the uh, hot end assembly. All right, so now we can plug it in. So obviously we didn't turn it on. I plugged it in and uh, turned the power switch and nothing happened. Uh, so I have a suspicion that the power supply is set to 220 volts, European standard, and we're here in North America at uh, 110 or 120, depending on who you ask. So my favorite part anyway, is opening it up and figuring out what makes it tick. They've used really beefy screws on the bottom instead of those tiny ones that are very uh, likely to strip. And there's only about a dozen of them. All right, so with the screws removed, we have a Meanwell power supply, 350 watts, 24 volts on this guy. It's a really slim power supply. And the voltage selector is on this side. I'll take a look at that in just a second. Cooling fan for the board, another one for the board. Um, the motor for the Z lead screw is here. And we have a 18 mega 2560, so your standard uh, Arduino 2560 board, or chip powered board. Uh, and then this uh, daughter board here for the screen. There's also interestingly a uh, micro USB, sorry, mini USB uh, port right here on the board, uh, but it's facing inside the case, not the outside. Um, they've chosen to face the uh, USB-B, the printer style USB connector to the outside of the printer. And there's uh, quite a large heat sink across um, all of the drivers, uh, one big heat sink, as well as another one over here, which looks to be across um, one, two, three, four other chips. I'm not sure exactly what those guys are. Um, and they've also hot glued a lot of these in so that there's no chance of them coming loose. So the reason we open this, let's check out the power supply. So my suspicion was right. This is currently set to 230. I'm gonna flick this down to 115. And then before bolting this all back on, let's just see if we get, there we go. So we've got power now. So let's put this back together. So I got the bottom button back up. I've reinserted both spools of filament. I took one of them off. Um, and now we're ready to plug it in and turn it on. Hopefully this time. There we go. 
So before we auto home, I just wanna make sure that I have enough clearance so that the bed doesn't hit the nozzle as it raises up to the end stop. You do that by unscrewing this bolt here. You know, I've already unscrewed it basically as far as I can without it coming right out of the uh, threaded hole there. But at least with it raised all the way up, I know that this bed's gonna stop long before it hits the nozzle. So let's go to the screen. Standard kind of Marlin screen. Go to prepare and then auto home. The nozzle is going to move to the front left corner and then the bed will move all the way to the top. Okay, so as you can see, we have some space between the nozzle and the bed still luckily. Um, so what I can do is tighten this screw, make it shorter essentially on the back. Got to loosen the bottom nut first, tighten it down and then tighten the bottom nut again. And then just home it again until you're at least relatively close. And then we'll take up the rest with, uh, with the tension knobs and the springs. So just one more time, I'll go to prepare, auto home. Okay. So standard paper leveling method, but first we've got to heat everything up to temperature. So back on the screen. I just hit auto home again, of course. Go back to prepare. And then we should be able to do preheat PLA. That will be fine. And on this firmware, they have them both preheating. So the hot end is going to 195, the bed's going to 45. I'm gonna bump the hot end up just a little bit to about 205, kind of closer to a normal printing temperature. And uh, we'll leave the bed at 45. I'm not familiar with this particular build tack surface. So uh, I know that especially on like an under three, it's really aggressive. If you're running it really hot, uh, things can almost like weld to it. So we'll give that a second to heat up. So as I said, we're just gonna use the standard paper drag technique. So now that everything's up to temp, it's actually uh, tighter than it was before. You might be able to hear the drag. Um, a lot of this is just kind of by feel. So, you know, righty tighty. So this would be tightening it, compressing the spring. So I'm gonna loosen it a little bit to increase the drag. Okay, that seems good. Um, so, go to prepare. And then there should be a, they call it bed auto leveling, but really this is just gonna bring you from corner to corner. So this will bring us about 30 millimeters inset from the corner or so. And then we'll go through this process again. So make sure that there's a decent amount of drag. And then just go back to that prepare bed auto leveling and then next step again. And it will go, in this case, it's gonna go uh, clockwise, corner to corner. And sometimes it'll even do the center as a kind of a fifth point. So in the back here, there's absolutely no drag at all. And now hopefully you can hear the difference. All right, so it is gonna do the center as well as a fifth point and in the center it's very tight. Now it's not entirely surprising because I did have to make quite a big adjustment on this uh, one corner here. So it's always in your best interest to go around maybe at least twice, especially if you're making significant adjustments to any corner because each corner impacts the others. Um, so I'm gonna do a whole cycle one more time. So now after two, two uh, full courses of bed auto leveling, the five different points. The center now has a normal amount of drag just like the corners. So we can see what we have on the SD card and do our first test print. And we're back with the CR5S and our test prints or attempts at test prints. So all of the G-code files that were pre-sliced on the SD card, they failed. 
um, and they usually failed by watching time lapse we were able to figure out um, on the purge tower. So as it gets to the purge tower, it kind of squirts out this, this glob. Now this is not one of their sliced files, but it's an example. It squirts these little globs of, of filament. And over time, they would build up to a ridge. And then the next time when the nozzle comes over, it would hit that glob, the purge tower would get knocked loose, or it would get caught on it and cause a layer shift. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what's going on with their pre-sliced files. Um, so I took it upon myself to use Cura and do a multi color slice like I did with the CRX, which is a very similar two in one out nozzle. Um, and it doesn't play nice with that either. So unlike the CRX, the firmware on here doesn't handle the second extruder very well. Um, so when Cura says set the second extruder to 200 degrees or whatever it is, it sits there waiting for the second thermistor to read 200 degrees. There is no second thermistor, there's only one, there's only one hot end. Uh, so it would inevitably just pause forever and your print would stop at the very first color change. So I had to manually go in, edit the G-code and remove every reference to the second thermistor or second hot end temperature settings so that there's only one hot end temperature setting for, throughout the whole print. Um, and then it would actually print and do the color swapping. Um, there is a rather large purge block uh, because I have to try to bleed this black out so that I can get a nice clean blue. Um, and on other sides, you can actually see the bleed through. Another easier to see example would be this Pikachu. You can see the bleed here between the red and the orange. So if you have a color that's very strong, like a black, um, you need to make sure that you have an even larger purge block so that you have enough time to purge the blackout when you're switching to blue, um, or in this case, from the red to the orange. Um, a couple other concerns that I have about this machine. Uh, when I went to level the bed and home Z, I found that this switch, the Z limit switch up here, was so high up that uh, the bed would actually bottom out before hitting the switch. Um, and there's no adjustability there. So we actually had to drill new holes to move that switch down about 10 millimeters, maybe 15. Um, there is about two millimeters of adjustability in the slots that they give you for the screws, but that just simply wasn't enough, clearly. Um, so we had to modify that. And as we started using the screen, the uh, control knob just broke. It was not working. Um, so we had to solder on a, it was like seized. So we had to solder on a new um, control knob or the rheostat piece of it anyway. Um, so that aside, at least I got it to print. Uh, it prints single color just fine, like any kind of Creality Bowden printer would. Um, but the multicolor thing leaves a lot to be desired. Um, I didn't want to modify the firmware, but that'll be our next step. We'll be flashing the firmware with a new base Marlin, probably Marlin 2. We'll configure it properly, um, and then hopefully it handles the G-code as one would expect. Anyway. Hopefully all that was useful. Remember to like and subscribe and ring that bell to get notified when we upload more videos. Thanks for watching.